morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corbid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning. And how are you doing this morning? I am feeling pretty darn good, not going to lie. I actually had a decent nice sleep for a change. I did watch the Red Blacks get their butts handed to them by the Montreal Alouettes last night, which kind of was not something I enjoyed. But, I mean, they did win the Grey Cup. They are a heck of a good football team, so that does happen. So Mr. Beaver, unfortunately, can't join this morning because uh, they were up till about 2 a.m., after the post-concert bliss, I assume, and he did not want to wake up his roommates because he has a, he's out there in the hotel with a couple of folks. So he said he just sent me a message says, "Yeah, I'm not gonna not gonna be able to contribute this morning." Which I said, "Hey, no problem. I can I can run the show solo." So first off, let's thank our founding sponsors, the Miss Fee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, CanadianTarot.com, and the Peppermaster for all your saucy pepper needs. Or something to that effect. I don't know. Feel free to use that, folks, if you want. Peppermaster, folks, your saucy pepper needs. So we do have a guest we're expecting this morning. I say we as in the royal we because I am flying solo this morning. But let me get a sip of coffee here first. Oh, that's so very, very good. Yes, we do have a um, scheduled guest this morning. And I just realized I... I've posted something twice now. (laughs) Oh, silly, silly me. I posted the same show twice on the audio-only version of the podcast. I I apologize for that. I do make these mistakes from time to time because I am a little bit old and I am kind of feeble some days. This happens to be one of those days. So our friend JB is is scheduled to join us. Hopefully he can soon. Um, It's going to be a relatively short show program this morning though because my ride will be here to pick me up at 7 45 a.m so i do have a hard exit at 7 40 um i need to uh, gather my work iphone which i think is on the bar or is it on the at the front desk table there sorry i'm at the i'm just asking bridget to grab my work phone so i know where i'm going and exactly what time i'll be here in case i get a message because I'm a little bit frazzled, even though I am wide awake and feeling good, and I'm on my second cup of coffee for the morning. Took Miss Lola out, and she tried to chase squirrels, but I wouldn't let her, so I'm trying to get her under control, little by little, slowly. She did capture a squirrel yesterday, but didn't eat it, thankfully. I think we did discuss that, but I don't remember. That was 24 hours ago. And I am, thank you, darling. That's exactly what I was looking for. And let's see, what have I got? I've got a message here, okay. That's fine, and a message here, and that's fine, and do we have anything telling me that my schedule has changed this morning? And No, so far so good. So it's looking like I will be heading out at 7.40 a.m. so that I can can, uh, go and earn a couple of bucks to keep this show running and keep a roof over Miss Lola's head, because after all, it's her apartment. I just happen to live in it. So yeah, we're hoping, hoping JB can join us this morning. We wanted to discuss his most recent uh, video. Well, I shouldn't say most recent video, but his most recent visit to Grand Prairie, Alberta, where he had a TED Talk about universal basic income and the massive benefits 
it provides to everyone. As the saying goes, a rising tide does lift all boats. And in the case of a universal basic income, it would do exactly that. And right now, the system is set up to punish people. You see, the system is designed to keep, keep us poors down. With a universal basic income, you get the money, period. No questions. That's it. Provided you filed a tax return and have an address. I mean, there are some caveats. You can't just hand money out willy-nilly to anybody. You do have to meet some criteria. But the criteria is very basic and minimum. The idea behind it goes back to, I think, 44 BC, uh, when Julius Caesar issued a stipend to everybody. You see, the thing is, when you give money to people, when you give money to wealthy people, they will just hide it in an offshore account. When you give money to somebody like me, I will use it to do things like pay down some debts, get all my bills paid, put some money away to save for the future, which I'm able to do a little bit thereof, but not nearly enough so that I could ever retire. I will be working until I die because CPP, OAS, and GIS won't be nearly enough to keep my head afloat. Head afloat, head above water, keep me floating. You know what I'm saying. So yeah. A universal basic income would benefit every single Canadian, no matter your walk of life, your stripe, what your situation is. And we could dispense with things like EI, welfare, or what do they call it? Social assistance, I guess. And ODSP, which, as we all know, doesn't pay nearly enough to survive on right now. And it'd be, well, you know, the best thing you can do for somebody is to give them a job. But if you cannot physically work, and remember... Every single person on planet Earth is one catastrophic accident away from being placed on disability. It's that simple. I, it could happen to any one of us, myself included. I could have an accident at work. A car could jump a curb. There are a million things. I don't think about them because they drive me crazy and I have enough anxiety as it is. I don't need to add to it. But any single one of us could end up in that position tomorrow. PNC Bio can talk to you, uh, can, can, can address this directly, how, how the PNC went from high income earner to, well, ODSP, correct, PNC? Correct me if I'm wrong, please. And all due to health issues. And, and that is what happens. It can happen to any single one of us. You can wipe out your life savings. You can wipe out everything you've got set aside for your future. Like that. One catastrophic accident and your life changes forever. And right now the system is set up to keep those people under the heel of their boot. CPP is the same as ODSP. Enjoy everyone. Yeah, no kidding. It won't be enough to survive on. It really won't. And folks who are on ODSP right now, I don't know how they make ends meet. Now my father, fortunately, you know, he's military, so he had a healthy pension, but the rest of us don't. CPP is the closest thing we can get to pension, and it doesn't pay enough. It's, it's our money, yes, it's invested on our behalf, but it doesn't pay nearly enough. So we need to, we need to get the uh, UBI going so that we can actually have a, a better life and a better future. And to, to, to discuss that in depth, the man himself, who's just joined, he's in the green room, I'm going to bring him in in just a second, who all the way from uh, north of Toronto, just outside of Toronto, and recently in Grand Prairie, Alberta, our friend JB. How you doing, sir? Hey, hopefully you can hear me. Sorry I uh, was a little bit late. I'm still getting used to waking up early. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest. And uh, well, my, wife sh my wife shook me. She's like, you need to wake up. You need to go. I'm like, oh, that. So I like run downstairs from here. So aren't you apologize? Aren't, aren't you a new father though? I am. I am. Uh, but so uh, congratulations. But doesn't that wake you up early in the morning? That's the problem. Is it wakes me up and then I fall back to sleep. So I'm so uh, tired. So it it just didn't line up. But, I understand. Uh, yeah. I'm I'm like a doggy doggy daddy father. So uh, mm. five a.m. Ms. Lola. Yeah. Climbs onto the bed, licks my face, and then looks at me like, let's go out, let's go out, let's go out. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I mm -hmm. feel your pain. I really do. Although, the, the pain for me is I will have a toddler for in the next 10 or 12 years. As you know, because you've been down this road, your toddler will become slowly independent and, and require upon you a little bit less. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I'm I'm in my 30s and I still call my parents like I need something like I'm 10. Right. It just yeah, oh, doesn't yeah, stop. Yeah. Right? But di so. it's different. Yes. But yeah. that never changes. That never yeah. changes. Yeah. yeah, no, I agree. I agree. So, so Sarah, um, saw the TED talk, loved it. Uh, there's something mm -hmm. I'm working on doing something, doing a little something for you. What I'll do is I'll, I'll put oh. it together. I'll put it together and I'll send it to you directly and then you do with it whatever you want. Okay. But I, I think you may like it. I think you may like mm -hmm. it. We'll, we'll see. We'll see how it works out. I'm still, I've got it mostly formed in my mind what I want to do, but we'll see mm -hmm. and send it off to you and then you can oh. do whatever you like with it. So okay. how, how was it received in Grand Prairie? You know, surprisingly well, what I will give credit for is that Grand Prairie being a, a north uh, western Alberta town, oil and gas town, uh, does have a, a tiny, tiny little progressive, I guess you could say, pocket inside of it. Uh, the organizer of this event uh, has said to me they always try to get... Uh, more progressive voices because he he believes that more people are in that sort of progressive state than I think they realize. I think there's a I, lot of political uh, familiarity with just following and towing the status quo or towing the line where when you actually talk to people, they they break it down in a way like, yeah, they're OK with universal single payer health care. Yes, they're they're OK with, you know, publicly funded schools and publicly funded leisure centers and, you know, things that public libraries, all these things that would be more of a, of a social program, which would lean you more towards uh, the left side of the, the traditional spectrum. So mm -hmm. uh, that, that was very well received. There was some, you know, because I was actually the first one at the event. They threw me oh. off first. Wow. So <laughs> That's so, always, you got to open the show. That's always yeah, tough. Which, which funny enough has its uh, advantages and disadvantages. Mm -hmm. And one of the disadvantages is, which they obviously cut out from the video is we had load of tech issues. And of course oh, yeah. I'm the first one up. So I had feedback, I had mic tr troubles. So, mm. uh, there's a lot of cuts and e clever editing that they did to kind of leave that out. But that, that aside, um, because I was first, I was able to set the bar. And then during intermission, we were all out in sort of the mingling uh, lobby area. And I had a couple people come up to me that were, you know, wow, I didn't think this was a good idea. I've heard of this before. I didn't really know what it was about. So it was very open. I had one person make the comment to me that it is communist and I don't think we should do it. And it's putting us down the wrong path. But ultimately, it was it was well received, I th mm. and and in in a town that is facing an industry that is depleting. Yes, like they, it or not, it is right. Yeah, exactly. They they are open to new sort of programs that uh, might be different, and they were very receptive. And I think that that is a greater sentiment to the current climate in Canada is when we when we talk about these new changes or these these different approaches we people want to hear it i think people mm. want to learn a new way of thinking when it comes to especially Agreed. when it comes to economic support i just think there's a lot of people very i will say very loud people individuals that follow around a news news, news organization that hires uh, billboard trucks and spreads you know hateful mm -hmm. messages that individuals and those groups of people that are that like that are very small in the greater picture of uh, the the political climate in Canada. Agreed. So, and I think that I think it, they're just loud, right? That, they're, they're, I think they're, they're the squeaky wheel, it, yeah. right? Is yeah. what it is. Effectively, yeah. I think more people in this country, and and you you can attest to this by by how positive that went in Grand Prairie, which is you know mm -hmm. a part of Alberta that's been conservative since, oh, I don't know, confederation forever, <laughs> right? forever. Uh, who were receptive to the idea of universal basic income. And I think a lot of it has to do when they realize, wait a minute, you mean we'll save money doing this? Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, we will. And that was my goal with my talk is I wanted to paint the picture that, you know, take the political ideology out of this, yes. right? Just let's look at it from a factual perspective. Let's look at it from a a common sense perspective. They're big mm -hmm. on common sense. That's their whole slogan right now is common yes. sense. And 
when you, when we break it down and, and there's fathers of the UBIs that are that are staunch conservatives. I said it yes. in my talk. Richard Nixon. Yes. Richard Nixon was and an You're not going to get much more conservative, right? No, no. He is he's well, he's old school conservative, so yes. a little bit different than modern, but and, yeah. but he impl- was attempted to implement it in his family assistance plan that the United States desperately needed. And it didn't pass because the Democrats didn't want to do it. Like it is astonishing to think that there is there is uh, old brow conservatives that are for this. Um, so from a common sense perspective, and I think when you're talking to right wing individuals or right leaning individuals, you have to break it down in a way that is, you know, uh, talking about saving things or reducing mm. things. Exactly. And if I if I went to a conservative and say, hey, I have this great plan that's going to reduce unemployment, reduce spending, and reduce bureaucratical oversight, you got a conservative's ears wide open at that point. It's true. So, it's true. It's absolutely. One of my friends who's who said, I'm, I'm a conservative, he says it to this day. He's in his 70s. Now, he hasn't voted conservative in the last few elections. He's been voting NDP because he's like, Whatever that is, it's not mm. conservative. Yeah. I have a he's a progressive. And he's, he's a strong supporter of UBI. Mm-hmm. And, and some, I said, really? He goes, yes, because it will save us billions in the long run. Number one. Exactly. Number two, it will uh, increase, um, it, it, you know, that social contract will increase safety in communities. Because police are dedicating their times to doing actual police work as opposed to having to take care of things like this. Our hospitals will be less crowded. The, you know, the, it just at homeless shelters, they might be able to disappear altogether. And food banks, which are a failure of society because they should not exist, especially in 2024, because we are a very rich nation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We could do away with food banks. And then people say, well, what are those people going to do for work? Um, well, they have a UBI now, so they won't need to starve. That won't happen, number one. And number two, they can go back to school and study if something in that they've been interested in. Exactly. You know, yeah. It's, just, the, it's all the, good. There's no downside to it. I mean, yeah, the, the, there are some, some people that have pointed out some potential downsides. And the only downsides that they say, in my opinion, that I think are benefits, like the, the complete uh, renovation of this capitalistic system we have. You know, the pro-capitalist individual will be like, this is bad because, uh, you know, it, it, it throws us into more social support and uh, you will own nothing and never be happy. All these, all these you know, talking yeah. points. But through every analysis that uh, uh, smarter people than me, actual like economists have broke this down and said, no, this is capitalism. This is something that you should want, because if yes. you cash infuse individuals, what do people do with money? A lot of people save or put it away, but they're eventually going to spend it, yes. right? So, you know, that's why it's a, it's a one to two. You spend one dollar as a government in a universal basic income, and you'll typically get two dollars back. You get the dollar that they were spending, the dollar you gave them for living or or whatever. But then in their employment that they're doing, they're going to spend that another dollar or two to back into the economy because when you give people financial stability they tend to spend when you when you give people some financial instability they hoard and they save they're like yes. i don't you know i we're we're both we're family on a, a reduced income right now because we're both on a leave right mm-hmm. so we had to shave things like we shaved our our, our, our netflix subscription not mm-hmm. paying for that we were shaved this we're not going on a vacation this year we're not spending less money because we are more cash reduced because of the newborn so this is what I mean. Like, but if we both got a universal basic income, we wouldn't we wouldn't have to shave down these different luxuries in life. Uh, I'll be able to do more uh, spending for, uh, for purposes. So it, it, this this idea and I, what I said in the talk is we're far past the concept phase. We have done yes. so many different studies and pilots and different ways and attempts to try to do this thing of a basic income and every single time the data shows that this is a benefit like there, there's there's no other way to interpret it it's like there's no downside every time we've done it both in yeah. canada and elsewhere it's worked it's just worked and mm-hmm. That's why I think we need to scale up, do it at a provincial level, potentially do it at a, um, try it for a year at the federal level, 
right? See what happens. Just just say, let's do it for a year. Let's not commit. And let's just see. Let's well, just see. Let, so. like, like, let's take one example that's not not exactly a UBI, but it, it shows how a government investment can make a difference. The province of Quebec, which has had their $8 a day daycare for almost 30 years now, I think. Yeah. Close to 30 years. Has shown that it is it has put something like 30 times, I could be off on the numbers, 20 or 30 times money into the economy that it's ever taken out. Mm-hmm. And not only that, they have the highest percentage of women who've entered the workforce versus any other province in the country. And since the new programs come in, Seamus O'Regan was on CBC about a week ago talking about how quickly the uptake in women going back into the workforce, that they were shocked at how quickly it took place. And I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah. Now imagine if you had $10 a day daycare and a UBI. Imagine what that could do. Now you'll have the naysayers who'll say, well, that'll just make people lazy. And I'm like, no. It doesn't. It, it, it doesn't. There's going to be a very tiny percentage of people that A, cannot work. That's a given. That is a given. And then there's another percentage of people that just don't want to. That's always going to exist. It exists mm-hmm. right now and it won't change with UBI. As a matter of fact, I think and I do believe with the UDI, UBI, it has shown that more people have gone back into the workforce. It does. Yeah. Because right now on a welfare program, okay, you get this this tiny little stipend. And all of a sudden, oh, I, I got some work over here. But they cut all, whatever you earn gets taken away from you or it gets taken away altogether. It's like you, you're never getting ahead. Well, I, I have a friend that I helped. Uh, 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 I, I volunteered with this organization that assisted uh, seniors through transitioning from uh, male to female, female to male, whatever. Right. And uh, I volunteered and I was partnered up with this wonderful uh, woman who transitioned later in life and she's disabled. She has a bunch of various disabilities that mm. makes it so she can't work. She right. she's, a, she's unable to do a job. And because I volunteered with this organization and was helping her just taking her to the grocery store, or taking her to a doctor's appointment, just assisting, right? right? Her ODSP worker considered that to be care, like yeah. to be assistance, and investigated us, me and my partner at the time, that if we were financially supporting her. Like, that's how much, like, these systems are designed in these caseworkers, which, again, these are just people doing their job. So I'm not right. mad at the caseworker themselves, but they, they are, they, it is designed in a way to push you out of the system. And I'm sorry, if somebody is permanently disabled to the point where they're unable to work a job, like a full time job, then we shouldn't be hounding those people if they want to get 20 bucks from a friend to go uh, uh, for, for a lunch right with it, it's just like it's so ridiculously stupid and then but then the other funny thing is this individual who i've talked uh, uh, about a basic income a lot she's able to work a part-time job maybe 10 hours a week maybe sitting at a a, a front desk of a of a library mm-hmm. or a, a a leisure center like some very low very easy job to do but if she started to take a part-time job to do that, she would lose all her disability. All of it. Which is not right. If she's saying, I'm able to work for 10 hours a week, a small little part-time gig, or maybe or even something online, right? Something yeah. remote. Uh, she should be able to do that, but still receive her disability. That just doesn't make sense to me. And that's kind of this basis of of, of a basic income is... The, the money you also save is reducing in bureaucratical oversight. And I'm a big, yes. I'm a big supporter of that is like the less we have to spend on people, just physical people to administer these various programs. We, we can save money that way. And as you said earlier, people were, well, what are we going to do with these jobs? It's like, well, I'm a big believer that jobs don't go away. The jobs just change. They change. They just change to something else. Like this whole uh, anger about self checkouts. Like it's taking jobs away. It doesn't change. It doesn't it just changes the cashier job to do something else in the grocery store, right? Well, and the so, uh, adversely, you know what it's done? It's created more folks like me, techs yeah. who have to go and fix and repair and install, and so that you need to upgrade your skill set and go back yes. to school to be able to do that. So it does. Yes, it takes away jobs, but it creates jobs that pay more money. 
Now, am I for the, all of this? Well, it's kind of inevitable. So whether I like it or dislike it is, is not, it's neither here nor there. It's inevitable. We need to be able to start taxing those machines as if they were an employee though, and have the corporation pay taxes into the system for AI and, and automation. So like a robot, for example, one of the, you walk into the, the golden arches and they have the big screens and there might be one, one cash, maybe two. Mm-hmm. Even in a busy place, they want you to go to the screen. Well, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> they want you to go to the screen and, and tap everything in and pay and everything. And then you just walk up and grab it. You have no interaction with a human being. It's mm-hmm. all AI mm-hmm. and touch screen and tech. So if we tax that machine as if it was an employee as a cashier and that tax revenue goes into the system, that'll help everybody. Because as, as jobs like that, they do disappear. Those jobs are disappearing, right? Yeah. As they disappear, what about somebody who, uh, say, for example, the, the, the single mother who works two or three part-time jobs to keep a roof over her head and food on the table for her child? Mm-hmm. What about the student who was trying to get enough money to go because they come from a, a lesser means family who wants to go to university but da- does not have the ability to borrow $100,000? Yeah. or doesn't want to be $100,000 in debt. So they take three or four jobs, but all of a sudden those jobs don't exist. So here is where the UBI can come in to help. Like I said, rising tide lifts all boats. Yeah. And and when we look at other countries in the world that have uh, explored a basic income, uh, you know, political, geopolitical issues aside, but if when we look at Iran... Iran mm-hmm. has been doing a basic income since 2011. They've been doing it for over a decade. And it's changed and it's been revamped and topped up and reevaluated to various different types of intent. But Iran unemployment is like practically zero. Like right. they're, they're just, there's a reason that, like, remember, think back to the 9 11 timeframe, you know, the 2001. Mm-hmm. You never heard of Iran. Iran was this big country in the Middle East, but they weren't this giant superpower. And now they're this massive, massive country that is causing all these geopolitical issues in the world because their people are happy and being taken care of so their country can start to prosper, right? Like these, these rise of these, think of the current superpowers in the world and take the United States out of it. What are it's Russia, China, and India, or Mm -hmm. India and, and to Iran, arguably. And these are countries like, again, geopolitical decisions aside that have taken a different approach when it comes to taking care of their people. And, you know, argue like we could argue that it's for the worse. And I think some have done it a little bit more extreme, but it, it, it just proves the point that the whole, you know, double down, triple down on the capital, h- hardcore free market capitalism. When we double down on that, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It, it doesn't work as intended. So. When we, we, we need to look at some other ways to do this and in the more, you know, we talk about the Scandinavian model of taxation and, you know, Norway is probably a better example of, of <laughs> uh, a, a better uh, way of doing this. But Norway is one of the happiest and most freest countries in the world. In the world. Yeah, well, it, Why? It's Norway, Finland and Sweden, they, te- they seem to take the top spot each year. Sometimes it's a three-way tie. Yeah. And in Norway, the biggest thing they did, which Canada missed the boat on doing this, is they nationalized their oil industry. Mm -hmm. Their oil and gas did not, for the most part, touch the private sector. And Norway is loaded. It's the richest country on earth. They're loaded. Yeah. And it's just like, why? Because they took their resource rich country and said, now we're we as a country are going to have our best interests in mind and and nationalize this. Well, that's what the prime minister Trudeau tried to do in 1979. And and what did they say out west? Let the bastards freeze in the east. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And national energy program. Yeah. And we, we've tried various different attempts, but this aside is Canada is positioned in right in a position right now mm-hmm. to uh, try something that could completely uproot this idea of free market capitalism. We, we have the position, we have the money and we have the, the data to show that this is something we can do. And I think a basic income, you know, 
starting a basic income, especially a universal basic income in Canada, we are the best country to try it. We are Agreed. lower in population from mm -hmm. our American counterparts or even some of our European counterparts. We are incredibly split, spread out. So we have various economies inside of our greater economy. You got the, the fisheries in the on the coast. You got the oil and gas in the central of the country. You got the tech sectors in, you know, Kitchener, Guelph, Waterloo and Toronto. Mm -hmm. You have in Montreal. Montreal. You have uh, a heavy uh, government sectors in all these various cities. We, we are so different. Mm -hmm. That a basic income of implementing it in Canada would be very interesting thing to do because you could see how it affects all the different types of industries. And if it fails, we're not going to go broke because we are a rich country. We do right. have a, a resource backed economy. So I think we are probably the best position to try it, to show other nations we can do this. You should well, try it. You should look into it. We right? have all the diamonds, all the uranium, all the fresh water all the wheat, all the wood, and all the oil. <laughs> right? And fresh water. Yeah, that's why I said fresh water. We have fresh all water, of it. Yeah. 20, yeah. I think 20% of the world's supply of fresh water is in Canada. Uh, it, it, and that, that has me scared as a young yeah. person who now brought a human into this world. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, I know. I No, I hear you. <laughs> that is going to become the next big, and they've been talking about this for a long time, how that will be the next big resource is fresh water. Yeah. Drink, drink access to, water, access, access, access to, to fresh it. water. Yeah. Well, look at what it, happened in Calgary, right? With the water main <laughs> break, right? And and we can get into the yeah. political aspects of that. Let's do that at another show, though. Actually, because yeah. I would like to discuss that in depth, and I'd love to hear your opinion on it because that was about cutting red tape back in the seventies when they built that. Let's cut some corners here and there. It's supposed to last a hundred years. It didn't last fifty. Oopsie. Yeah. Whoops. Uh, it, I look, I, I, I made a video uh, the other day that I put out uh, on my on my TikTok channel. But when we talk about the current idea of capitalism and when we talk when this, this factors in artificial intelligence, this factors in all this stuff is one, when it comes to AI, mm -hmm. we need to be doing a different approach of, of, of thinking AI more as a tool, not right. as as a replacer. And capitalism as a design, capitalism as a, as a base, the fundamental basis of it is reduce your costs and increase your profits, right? Mm -hmm. Like spend less, make more. And of course, capitalism is going to push towards artificial intelligence and robots and yeah. machines because that's what it's designed to do. It's, it's designed to make the owning class more money. But funny enough is that artificial intelligence is even starting to figure out that this system is is there's a flaw to it yeah. there there's a game uh, there's a video game out there called city skylines it's been around for many many years it's mm -hmm. been reiterated in different versions but the latest one city skylines 2 came out a couple months ago and they heavily implemented ai and the whole basis of the game is you build a city you get a blank field you build a city from scratch and every little idiosyncrasy is involved from governments from zone from everything it's a fantastic game i've been playing it for years and they implemented ai for their market-based economy so figuring out like what's more expensive what's not you know all this stuff and ai figured out it caught the caused a housing crisis because it was told to follow this capitalist model and what ended up happening is the citizens when they made a lot of money bought an extra home to rent out and then raised the rents to the rent and yeah. it, the ai caused this this market issue yeah so what the the developers did was they told the ai okay well you can't be a landlord like landlords are against the law you can't do that and then all of a sudden the housing prices went down all of a sudden people were able to own more homes so like when we put even the the bare bones of capitalism into ai ai is like oh exploit people yeah. Take take as much money from them as we can and don't give it back to them. Like it's pretty bad when this system that we designed to be smart is starting to get smart. It's like, hey, no, uh, yeah, take money from people. So yeah, <laughs> well, uh, you, you know, our current situation we can largely blame on two people: Milton Friedman and Ronald Reagan. Yeah. Because they yeah. put shareholder above everything, and we have seen companies do this for decades now. Uh, fire a bunch of employees, buy shares to increase the stock price so that the executives get big bonuses, the shareholders get a larger dividend check, 
And then they mm-hmm. cut services left, right, and center while increasing the profit margin. Look at what's happened in, at Boeing, for an example. Mm-hmm. 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 They did just that, and the planes are dropping out of the sky. So anyway, there's a million other things I'd love to chat with you about, but I do have to go because I just yes. got a text message that my colleague is downstairs waiting for me. <laughs> so uh, thanks again for joining this morning, buddy. I really do appreciate it. I'm going to yeah. work on it this weekend. I'll get that. I'll send it to you in a, in a DM. Tell me what you think about it once I get it done. And if you want to use it, use it. If you want to toss it, do no, whatever. I, I, really I, to you. I appreciate whatever you're doing. You still haven't told me what exactly you're doing. So I well, you'll, you'll, I think it, I just want to keep your, I want to pique your curiosity. I think you, I think you may like it. Maybe not. It's up to you. Um, yeah, I'll get it to you this weekend. Okay. Awesome. I'm looking forward to seeing it. All right. Well, thanks for joining us again. I really do appreciate it. You Anytime. take care. And yep, we'll, uh, I'll be talking to you soon. We'll get you back in here sometime next week, maybe if, yeah. if at all possible. Uh, just, just quickly, I'm planning a trip your way in the summer in August. Oh, okay. So maybe we will figure out uh, a podcast or something that we sounds do. good to me, we'll, buddy. We'll talk about. It. We'll figure it out. All right, but, you take care. Yeah, take care. Bye bye. Okay, bye. All right, folks, that's it. I do have to go. I'm going to make it a really quick exit. Thanks for coming out. We really do appreciate and love every single one of you. Remember, if you want to contribute, you know how to do that. I'll put the thing on the screen. There's the coffee. And we have our uh, pod page. So you can scan that uh, logo on the screen at uh, below my mic flag. That'll take you to our pod page and the, what, the, the thing right up here underneath my finger, there are coffee page where you can donate if you like. We also have Super Chat available on the YouTube. However you like to contribute, we really do appreciate it. And yes, we, we are doing this to try and earn some money for the efforts that we put forth. So thanks for coming out. We love each and every one of you. We really do appreciate you tuning in to us every day. And apologies that today is a short show and Mr. Beaver couldn't be here, but sometimes that's how life goes. I got to run. I will take. Uh, see you later. So please take care, and I'll see you on Monday. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and the Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. <laughs>